think you can so if the girls can't come down as well but they can come down so we can sort of send a phone in is this oh that's working now isn't it yeah yeah um, well, I'm pleased to present this talk with Abdullah al-Mahri, Ali al-Mahri, and Ahmed al-Mahri, who unfortunately cannot be here, but helped an awful lot in putting this paper together. Um, 26 of the 38 talks I've given on modern South Arabian since 2011 have been given in collaboration jointly with one or more native speakers, and Abdullah and Ali have have contributed to a lot of these talks. This is the first time that Ahmed is involved, um, but he's been great in answering WhatsApp messages for me over the past few days. Um, I'm going to walk around, so if you can't hear me, do let me know. Can you hear? Uh, oh, OK, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. So in this talk, I'm going to look at the relationship between language and nature. In January, on January the 30th, we set up a centre at the University of Leeds for endangered languages, cultures and ecosystems. And over the past few years, a group of us have gradually been seeing how intrinsically linked endangered languages, or basically language, culture and nature is. Then, modern South Arabian, what the endangerment factors are. Then biodiversity, if we're talking about ecosystems, then I'll look at salient linguistic and cultural features. And then the relationship between language and nature in terms of species and languages. The colour system, space and measure, nature and metaphor. And then look on to language documentation and revitalisation. I've got one video and I've got several sound files that I will play for you. So... Most of these facts we know that indigenous languages reflect the close relationship between people and their natural environment. And we know that because languages have terms for things that occur in the natural environment which, th which are important to, to people. I used to put here regions of the world, but it's inhabited regions of the world which exhibit greatest biodiversity, also exhibit greatest linguistic, linguistic diversity. And there are maps which show that the greatest linguistic and biodiversity is basically along the equator with a few, a few um, cold spots along there, decreasing as you go up to the poles. And then this is important. Since 1970, there's been a 30% loss in biodiversity. Yeah, we know that. But then recent studies have shown that the loss in linguistic diversity is more than keeping pace with the loss in biodiversity. What is it about 1970? It's really an interesting question. And we find that endangered languages and endangered species tend to cluster in the same region. We also see that it's linguistic knowledge... I will need some more water. Linguistic knowledge can be used to revive endangered species. And we've got two really good examples of that in the in this south of the Arabian Peninsula, the Arabian oryx and the Arabian leopard. I do need more water. <laughs> Just get someone to bring some down. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, think mm. I think it's partly because of the heat. Right. So, if we look at modern South Arabian, this map should... The, uh, which is the one that does the... It should Anyway, it should come up into Saudi Arabia, but for reasons best known to ourselves at the time in 2013, it was decided to just base the map on Yemen and Oman. But there are, so there are six languages... Uh, Mehri is the most widespread, comes into Saudi Arabia, east of Saudi Arabia as well. Then we've got Sahrat, Hubiyot, Bathari, Harsusi and Skotri. The area where I have concentrated my work is around Dahbun and Rabkut. I've also done work around Hasik and Hadabin, Sadh and Mirbat, some in Salala and Jibjat, and then health in Yemen.
Thank you. <laughs> what are the endangerment factors of these languages? So firstly, the fact that they're unwritten languages. If you've got an unwritten language, if it then dies, there, you don't have the documentation to revive it. Um, coupled with that, we've got a literary high prestige national language, Arabic. When talking about the languages in Arabic, people will often refer to them as lahajet because they don't have a writing system. Urbanisation and education are huge factors. And then Islamic fundamentalism, particularly in the past decade or so, is taking its toll. Population movement, we've always had population movement, but there seems to be much more immigration and emigration and tourism in recent years. Communication, media, roads, airports, technology. But then the technology that we have, while it's threatening the languages, on the other hand, it's enabling us to record them better, to document them, to disseminate them. Um, and it enables native speakers to... to um, to, dis to disseminate songs, pictures, um, in, a very, in a very wide way. And in terms of politics, the problem at the moment, we've got a huge problem in the south of Yemen, in al Mahra, with the Saudi and UAE presence, um, and in Socotra, and that is in the last few months. And then the less, con the less prestigious modern South Arabian languages are losing out to the more prestigious. So in terms of degrees of endangerment, you can see the figures here. Whoops. Bhattari has less than 12 fluent speakers. Hubiot and Hartusi have a few hundred speakers. Saharat, around 30 to 40,000. Mehri, 100 to 180,000. Scotry, around 60,000. But of these figures, we're only relatively confident about Scotry because it's on an island, and Bhattari because we can go around and count people. There are no census figures for speakers of the languages. And we can't say how many tribe members are there because many of the tribe members no longer speak either Mehri or Saharat. The area is one of extreme biodiversity. So the Far and al Mahra receive the monsoon rains. They have four distinct seasons. So we have Kharf, the monsoon period from June to September, followed by Tsairab, these are the terms I'm giving in Mehri, followed by Tsaitu, Tsairab is the harvesting season, Tsaitu, winter, and then immediately going into the hot period. Okay. Socotra is the fourth most biodiverse island on the planet. You can see here all of its land mollusks, 90% of its reptile species, 33% of its 900 plant species are found nowhere else on, on the planet. What I said earlier was that endangered languages cluster in the same region as endangered species. So we've got the Arabian leopard here, critically endangered. I was speaking to Andrew Spalton, who's working on the leopard in Oman, has been in Oman for 30 years, and says they've managed to tag 50 individuals. It's found in the same area that Sahret's spoken, which is also severely endangered. Then when we look at, um, we look at this, the sea, the smooth tooth black tip shark is endangered. I don't have the figures for that, and it's probably a bit more difficult to get figures for, for, um, uh, for marine life, found in the same area in which Mehri is spoken, which is definitely endangered. If we look at salient linguistic and cultural features in these languages, is it perhaps the oldest continuously spoken Semitic language? I'm not a historian, so I can't say. But it does show some very um, archaic features. The retention of th three plain sibilants, 
which don't seem to be being lost in any of the languages, se, se, and she. Dual pronouns for persons, including the first person. These examples are from Mehri. Okay, okay, hey. They go into the form for all, so kolohki, kaleiki, kolohki, and all the verbal inflections as well. The dual is one of the things that is beginning to be lost in, um, in various of the languages. It is maintained, however, amongst older women. Older women tend to use the dual a lot. Um, and I have a large number of forms on, on the dual. In terms of the sounds, Saharet has the largest number of consonants, and then the other languages, uh, Mehri has around the same number as Harsusi, Hobyot, and Berkeri have slightly fewer, but they all have more than Arabic. I'm just going to play Abdullah going through the sounds. So the, the sounds that you're going to hear are the, the lateral, the emphatic lateral, the emphatic sibilant, the emphatic uh, uh, alveolar stop, the emphatic alveopalatal, and ke. Sounds going to work actually. Set, she would. Set, she would. Set, she would. Clap, shift. Clap, shift. Clap, shift. Sat, simmerate. Sat. Samrit, sa, samrit, ta, ta, tau, ta, ta, tau, ta, ta, tau, cha, chenai, chale, cha, chenai, chale, fa, admit, fa, admit, fa. Admit, ka, kai, kaliet, ka, kai, kbelt, ka, kai, kbelt, ka, kai, kbelt. But there is quite a lot of distinction between individuals and across tribes. So um, it's very important to recognize which tribe your speakers come from. Abdullah and Ahmed come from the Bidkur, sub-tribe of Beit Tuar, and Ali al-Mahri comes from the Beit Amaragit, sub-tribe of Beit Zmoda. The speaker I'm going to let you listen to now, and I'm interested in the lateral emphatic, and the pronunciation of the lateral emphatic here, comes from the west. He comes from Beit Lafari, from Habarut, near the Yemeni border, but not in Yemen. So what we've got in this area is more of an, of an emphatic, an emphatic sonorant, an emphatic lateral sonorant. Naming is really important, naming of culturally specific items. And I was wanting to put in a subtitle to this talk, but I realized I'd already got one, so it would be a bit difficult to put in another, on naming to numbering. We'll see why naming to numbering later. But there, for culturally important items, there are, there is a huge there are huge distinctions between um, between terms between verbs for 
quite small differences, and I'm not going to go through these words, but these are all words relating to milk. And it's not a closed, li it's not a closed list. All boys are brought up being able to recite their lineage as far back as they can. And they normally recite back at least 18, 18 to 20 generations. Many of them go, go back to Al-Mahri. So I'm going to play this. This is Ali. But at the same time, men are known informally by their matronymic. So, Baruqiyar, Barqayta, Barwaya. Women are known by their pat, uh, patronymic. So I'm known, known as Bud Peter when I'm over there because my father's Peter. And whole families and individuals are often known after a female ancestor. So you've got Beit Barangema, Beit Barueya, and Khalid Rueya, one of my consultants, actually has a Rueya in his passport. Said, Berehmet, Berubhait, Berselem, Bershei, Baramer, Berselem, Bersai, Barale, Bertemet, Berjagu, Baram Regi, Bersamode, Berbuki, Berehmet, Bergisus, Berserehi, Beres has height. Poetry is, in, in, is in, incredibly important in the culture, and there are very few families where poetry is not recited on a regular basis. There are people who are famous for sung poetry and for simply recited poetry. Poetry was used in narratives. It was used to express historic, to describe historical events. It was coded to express love so that a lover could be talking to his loved one in front of a lot of other people and no one understood apart from those two. These are the days before WhatsApp. I'll just play, I'll play this one through. It's about a tribal, tribal conflict. وحكى ليمنيس غزيم دارتك بسم الحلا وفرض بونة وثبا داخل ليثك ايل وخاف بان تلم تاسوى بارائب واثكا ثاك صاب عشاقها ايمان سنة هوات العات مكن يتم نتبها يا ويذن بيم سيد يلوي من ويبها رد غار تلو صلبا I could listen to him all day but I expect most of you couldn't um we felt it very important to do video recording of things like things like poetry because it's not just the words, it's not just the intonation, it's not just the sound. It's a whole event. And this event would not have taken place without the two participants next to, next to the singer. And the way in which he's sitting, the way in which he's holding his stick is extremely important in delivering the poetry. we go on to language and nature, we've got division of the, division of the color, color palette. And colors in many languages are not basic, they're derived from, from something else. So I was reading about Wawa, a Cameroonian language the other day, where they have white, black, and red. And the word for white comes from the word for moon, the word for black comes from the word for darkness, and the word for red comes from the word for ripeness. What we have here, we have these basic colours, Ofer, Ewer, Ubo, and Taur, and I've given those all in the masculine singular. So, Taur means basically anything that doesn't fall into these other categories, green, blue, yellow, all of these colours, I don't know how I can get the, mm, oops, it wasn't that, <laughs> so you see the yellow, the yellow above, so that's, that would be described as hetlaur, and if people wanted to specify then they would say hetlaur el his haytem, 
Hetlaur, like the sky. Hetlaur, al Hithayotin. Hetlaur, like the sun. Hetlaur, al Hithamarai. Hetlaur, like grass. So we have these basic colours, and this is one of the areas that the languages are beginning to lose out because children, even children who, are, who live in small villages, who live in the mountains, would are much more likely to revert to saying Ahmar and Azraq and Aswad rather than the original modern South Arabian terms. When you get to livestock colours, remind you of these basic colours, which I've given in the feminine singular because livestock, the basic the basic goat is female, cow is female, camel is female. We have these basic colours, but once we look at livestock, then we have far more gradations. Afarut, hazmayit, ubanit, hatlarit, samhmiyah, malahat, judayit, thahwiyah, hukak. I worked with horses before I went into academia, and I still ride every now and again. And anyone who knows about horses knows that there is a whole set of terminology for different colours, different markings. And it's pretty much the same thing here. So we've got camel and the goat. So we've got afarut, basically means bay, hurut, not hazmeyit, ubanit, white. And then we've got things like terkat, spotted, tibrik. Piebald, abdir, splodged, thamim, etc. If we look at space and measure, when I was teaching Arabic, we used to teach the cardinal points, shimel and janub and sharq and qarub. And then in Yemen, you realize that at least where I was in Sana'a, uh, Shemel and Qarb were just not used. You use terms which refer to places or which refer to uh, topogra topographical features. So Shemel in Sana'a would be Ghibli and Junub would be Adani, towards the Ghibli and towards Aden. In these areas, it's topographical features that are used to describe cardinal... Uh, to describe directions, with al-haq meaning upstream and umtsa meaning downstream. And then other terms such as najd, the desert, tha'ir, the mountains, arawram, the sea, will be used. And they have this lovely saying, if someone knows nothing, they don't know upstream from downstream. And this is what we're finding today, that many of the young children the young people indeed do not know upstream from downstream because they are no longer engaged with upstream and downstream, the movement of the waters, being in the wadis. They're inside. A measure through naming. Um, it's considered bad luck to count the number of to count your animals if you ever ask someone how many how many livestock they have how many camels they have how many goats they have they will either say mirkin i've got a lot or khawr i haven't got very many or they will use one of these terms but you do not count so i've seen younger members of the family counting someone's an older female relative's goats and she gets really cross and she'll take the stick to them so we've got under it, very few go goats. Under it is also used to describe the milk that is kept back for children, for, for young children or for old people. So under it is basically the number of goats that you need to get milk. Hatlar, very few goats. Gizhanut, a small herd. Gizhat, medium sized. Fark, large. And then for cows, we've got Gantalot, for a large herd of cows. Thub. The Heibun, an augmentative, large herd of camels. Um, and we get it also for, in terms of important fish. So sardines will have a special term if you've got a huge number of sardines. Rabbit fish, see lop. And uh, what was the other one? And uh, fish in general. 
So I had this conversation the other day with someone by WhatsApp, and he sent me this little recording where he's saying, Mutaretsud, a large amount of fish, um, Sidlog Termet, a large number of rabbit fish, and what's the other one? Adgarot or Adnigar. So I'll just play that. These are in, in Saharet, not in Mehri. And it's interesting what livestock, what animals do have terms for group sizes and what don't. So, um, Abalone, which is a very prized shellfish, doesn't appear to have, there doesn't appear to have to be a term for a small or a large amount of abalone. And then we've got all these dry measures, which are no longer used, but, but the older people know them. Makarit, Arbait, Gamut, Makyuk, and Tuskut, Bhup. And now this is being replaced by kilo, half a kilo two kilos, by numbers. What we're having is a system which is changing from one of naming amounts to one of numbering amounts. And then we have time through naming. Till the 1970s, people didn't have watches. So they judged time by the depth of darkness, the height of the sun, and shadow. These are times coming up to mid-afternoon. Um, the dim diminutives, so Kathlar is sunrise, and Thurek Oten is the diminutive of sunrise, means early sunrise. The diminutives, interestingly, refer to a time when the sun is lower in the sky. It's not necessarily earlier or later. So we've got here, Thura Kautan, as opposed to Kthark, Thubihan, early morning, as opposed to Ksobah, Thua early mid morning, as opposed to the Auban. And when we look at the other side, Kasarawan, which is already a diminutive, but Kasarayan, it's a dim further diminutive. It's later afternoon, Kalaini before sunset, Kalaani early evening, so the sun is lower in the sky. And even now, many of my consultants over the age of 40 won't tell me I'll see you at 10 o'clock. They will, they will say, they will say I'll, I'll see you at the Weleban, or I'll see you at the Oban, or I'll see you at Kalasar, or I'll see you at Kalaini. There's a bit of a problem with Kalaini, though, because for some people it means mid-afternoon. For other people it means the time when the cows, when the, when the cows and goats come in. Um, yeah, and dates is interesting that people, when, once they started to get their passports, they w if they didn't have a birth certificate, then they were all born on the 1st of January. Interestingly, using the Gregorian calendar, and not the Muslim calendar. Um, with many of my consultants, they find that they can deal with periods of like today and tomorrow, and periods of 10 days. And I think it's partly to do with the phases of the moon, that 10 days is okay, one month is okay. But shorter than that, it's a bit more difficult. So that the terms for the days of the week, and who the lahad, and who the lithnain, and who the thuluk, etc., um, tend to not be used as much. When we look at dating through further back, so until the 1970s, people didn't have, um, they didn't have birth certificates, they didn't know what the year was. So in order to relate birth and death and 
important events, it would go on some climatic event. And Sana'a, I remember that in order to be able to work out the age of someone, you would relate it to the Thawra. Will it dig up the Thawra or the Thawra? Um, the revolution of 62. And here it's climatic events. The ones up to Ona Tahrit are in Tahrit and Sinit al Haimar, Sinit al Kharkayit, and Sinit the Bit Fargil are in Mehri. So these important times when the monsoon rains failed, when there was severe drought, the year that the people left Jabal Qamar, so Ona to Qamarot, due to drought and headed east, the year of sorrow. Uh, when the, uh, there was so little rain that the cows all died. People then had to buy goats. Sinait al Haimar, a year of post monsoon cyclone when many people died. Sinait the Qarqayit, the year of drowning, when two ships were drowned off the coast of the Far, two sh ships were wrecked off the coast of the Far. And Sinait the Bit Fargit, when the whole of Beit Fargit died due to floods. Nature is also important in terms of gesture. And I've been doing some work with uh, Jack Wilson from the University of Salford over the past few years on gesture in, uh, in Mehrayit and, and Taharat. And what I want you to see, this young man, this is Abdullah, he's explaining the gestures that he used to describe where the rain clouds are. So people would say, I was in Wadi Habrut one time and I was, I was asked, where, where are the rain clouds? And I pointed and they said, don't do like that. You'll see what he says. So I'm going to say, 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 I'm so in the past, people would say, if you point like that at the rain cloud, then it's not going to come. You do it like that, and then it will come. So, nature and metaphor. Um, if you think that in five minutes of speech, it's been worked out that there are around 5.88 metaphors. If you don't understand figurative language, then it's, it can be quite difficult to understand what's going on. And there's a lot of metaphor relating to, to nature. So I'm not particularly good on flora, I'm getting better. But when I was told that this tree is called Seemer and that the expression Khahi Seemer is used to describe a man who is very tall with a shock of hair, I never forgot that plant. Um, and then you have, you have metaphor, figurative language coming up a lot in poetry. Wind from the west, stones he licks. And it's referring to a man who came from the west. People are often referred to metaphorically as wind or tribes are referred to as particular wind. In the past, people used to lick stones out of hunger to get the salt from it. And they would also lay stones on their stomach to reduce the feelings of hunger. Um, kalifut, no spoons, there was no metal. Kalifut is the bark of a tree which was used to eat with. And the term spoon, the, the word for spoon now is kalifut. And uh, they get a full added. Camel, we're pretty sure, comes from comes metaphorically from Urdhuk, a large date cluster because of the shape. And then we've got gr grammaticalization. Tracking is extremely important in this area. In matter of life and death, 
You need to be able to tell that that's the track of a, of a leopard rather than a rabbit. I mean, you're not likely to, check, to mistake that. You want to be able to track your own livestock. And each livestock, it's a bit like our thumbprint. My thumbprint is unique to me. So you can say something like, see, I keep it. Yeah, so we've got this term trace or track, which we believe has become grammaticalized to slough. It turns out to be. Clina ki beat a cabs hai beiti min the sluffes, sluffs hai bitk. I saw a camel. I thought it to be your camel, uh, to be my camel, fr but from its track, it turned out to be your camel. Language documentation and revitalization. So how long do I have? You'll give me a couple of extra minutes, won't you? Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you, yeah. So we had this documentation program that started in January 2013 to look at five languages. We were looking just at the uh, continental languages. Uh, Miranda Morris, who I work with, has done work on Socotra and uh, the Russian team are doing some fantastic work there. And about 150 speakers. We developed an Arabic-based orthography and have archived at ELA so as over 200 hours of audio material, the majority of which is open access, and 15, it must be more than 15 hours now of audiovisual documentation. Um, and we've done a lot of training of local community members to record, to transcribe, to discuss ethical consent, uh, to manage time, which is actually quite an important thing. So in terms of the revitalization and uh, uh, documentation revitalization um, steps that we've taken, what we've done as far as possible is involve native speakers in documentation and dissemination. So most of the material that has been documented has been documented either together with another native speaker or by the native speaker themselves, sending the material through Dropbox. We developed Arabic-based script, and I'll show you some examples of that. Tra training in transcription and translation. We developed a ch children's literature, and we may not have time for that. If we do, we'll come back to it. And we've got these archives with ELA, which have been translated into Arabic so that you can scroll down, you see the English and you see the Arabic, and they have a large number of links. And then collaborations. Um, I've been working closely with the Mehri Center for Studies and Research, which was set up in al a couple of years ago. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've been holding courses on language, culture, and nature in Salala, where we do three or four hours within four walls on the grammar, and then we go out into nature. We go to the beach, we go to the mountains, we go to the, we go to the desert, go swimming. We're seeing language in nature. Um, and we've done those for... Uh, people who aren't, necessar aren't from Oman. So far, we've, we've had 13 people from 13 different countries who have, who have come for these courses. And then last year, we did one for the University of Niswa. We developed this Arabic-based orthography based on what was happening in text messaging. Great, thank you. <laughs> so people tended to use th to express th. So we took the th, we took there and turned it, inverted it. I know it looks like a B, but it, a, P, a Persian P, but it's it's not. Um, and then for cha, which is cha in Saharat, uh, we took fad and put three dots on top. Cha is the emphatic counterpart of she. So just as seen, the emphatic counterpart of seen is fad. The Emphatic counterpart of she is sad with the three dots on top. And then we have a je. The system was developed for Tleherat because Tleherat had most figures, had most, uh, most uh, phonemes, and we just take a subset for the other languages. So the ones that are relevant for Mehri are the first three. Um, this is an example of transcription training. This was the first text that was transcribed using the first, uh, using the new transcription system, and this was the first published text. 
So the text was uh, recorded in the mountains. It was transcribed by Saeed al-Shahri. It was translated into Arabic by Saeed al-Mahri. And then we loaded it up on thefard.com. I don't think it's no longer there. We'll have to find out where it is. And sat back and waited and to see what reactions people would have. Um, and the two sides were really worried, but we got very positive. Um, do you want to hear it? No, probably haven't, don't have time. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see that you've got the z, the del with the two dots on, the um, for Taharat. Taharat is a distinction between z, the palatal alveolar z, and z, which is an alveopalatal with labialization. Z corresponds to her in the Mehmedes languages. Uh, so we, that, was the, that was the sound that we transcribed with three dots above and three dots below. Um, um, yeah, the S corresponds to SH in Mehri. So in order to have the maximally coherent system and consistent system, that's how we transcribed. Okay, now I'm going to go. 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 You heard you sent the act to the world by the other second. We is only. Let me look. I'll hear you in the day. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll stop that now. Well, one of the things we were interested in is how the transcribers dealt with things that were in Arabic. And you can see here that Saeed Shahri did two things. He either put the Arabic word in italics or he put it, if it was a phrase, he put it between brackets. But that was, that was really interesting. Um, we've also got. Uh, Several of the um, of our, our speakers and consultants have produced blogs on the website in uh, in Mahri. Uh, so this is one by uh, Abdullah Al Mahri. Um, um, and he's talking about what happened before the project and then what happened after the project and how they set up a WhatsApp group to check different terms. So the younger people might say, what's this? I've heard this word. What does it mean? And then the older people would get back and record with voice message rather than writing about what the word meant. Um, this is one by um, Ahmed al-Mahri where he's describing his brother's wedding and the roles of his brothers in that wedding. And then, yes, these are the courses on language, culture and nature. This was the Nizwa course. So why should we be working on the language culture ecosystem nexus now? And there, is, there has been such remarkable change within such a short period, social and environmental, in terms of linguistic. You've gone from a system of tribal reliance and self-reliance to one of government reliance. The government should do something. And we've had this real break in the human nature relationship. It's urbanization, I think, which has killed things. Urbanization, sedentarization. Many of the children, they spend most of their time in the house, in, then in the bus, and then at school. They are between four walls. And I've, I keep talking to people and saying, education is not something that is between four walls with a roof. Education can take place anywhere, and anyone can be your teacher. They don't have to have a degree. I was sitting with Abdullah's family, and his mum said to me, you're a professor, and here you are, sitting on the floor, eating food with us. And I said, yeah, I might be a professor, but you're the professor of the professor. You're bigger than me. Of course, I'll sit on the floor. Um, we've got loss of environment, loss of expertise. 
partly due to money, because people have the money to bring in people from, to bring in workers from Southeast Asia. So it's no longer the young people, it's no longer the young goat girls taking the goats out, or the boys going with their fathers with the camels. So they're losing that expertise, and they're no longer coming in contact with the plants and the fauna, which are important. And we've got this system where names were used, the, the lexicon is so rich in all of the languages, and names were used to describe different amounts, different groups, different group sizes, depending on what, what we were talking about, whether we were talking about goats, camels, or rabbit fish. We've got a system which is going now from names to numbers, in terms of dates, in terms of time. And what we have, what we've had over the past few months is, of course, politics. And we don't have time for that link. But what is happening in Yemen is absolutely appalling. Um, yes. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for this most inspiring talk. And we have plenty of time, so we have more than 10 minutes, let's say, for questions, discussion, comments. Yes, Martine. Can someone at least? Because we developed this from, we thought we need to develop the system that works for some work. Yeah? And then we take it and take a, sub, a subset. Stress, uh, the idea is stress corresponds to memory vitality of water and hydration stress. The correspondence with nesting stress is, is the less complicated symbol. Any other question or comment? Addition? Yes. Thank you very much for this uh, inspiring presentation. Um, I, in from your presentation, I hear a kind of frustration. It is a dilemma for every documentary linguistic uh, worker. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, people want to change their life. Uh, modernity comes in. People yeah. need, uh, want and need education for mobility and so on. At the same time, culture should be maintained in a, or we think culture should be maintained in a certain way. How do people react to your comments on that? And uh, yeah, yeah and how is the change? Yeah. And another thing um, you said in the beginning of your presentation, language laws and uh, ecological uh, changes go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And from your linguistic description about this naming, numbering, and so on, there seems to be a lot of culture still. Uh, uh, so n nature, yeah. at least. And how is that? How th is, uh, do you see a lot of change in that sense? Or di did you make that remark in a, gen in a general sense? Everything had to be fed. Everything had to be made. 
So it is, it, 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 it is a dilemma. But what we're interested in is teaching the young people about culture, about politics, about the past, and teaching them outside so that they can see the different times and, to, and be told stories about the use of this time, how they were used. Um, and we were really pleased with the way in which younger people responded to the documentation programme. It was the younger people who were able to use the digital recorders, who were able to use Dropbox, who were able to transcribe, upload things. But they weren't particularly interested in language when we first started. And within a few months, people would say, I've learned so much from my mum or from my dad or from my grandma. And now many of the people who I work with, the younger people, they will be sitting with their older, with the older generation and listening to stories and saying, yes, how did how did you, you make a, a water skill? How did you make a cradle? And how did you manage to carry that cradle out of wood and the water, those water skins, and have a child in your head towards the coast? And they're able to use that. Uh, and the other question was, uh, oh, about, yeah, the about nature. Nature. Yes. And, and yes. I mean, this is another thing. When you see something through someone's other else's eyes, when you see a change through someone else's eyes, it becomes much more real. And I remember going up, driving up to the, driving up to the mountains with Sally and Annie, um, and we were looking out and he said, do you see that slope there? I used to run down there and I used to trip over the plant and it would take me there. And you suddenly realise, having been up to the mountains with Miranda who had been there in the 1970s and 1980s, and then with me, what a change there was. <coughs> so we, yes, there's a lot of desertification, there's a lot of loss of, of really important plants, endemic plants. Um, many of you are going to say it's in, but not too many. Um, other questions? Or? Okay, over there. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to understand what is your program. You know what? What are your your proposing apart from? Let's say uh, preserving the uh, what you can preserve by these tools for uh, like uh, writing and stuff like that, or uh, documentation making, uh, dictionaries and so on to preserve these languages. Is there more that you can? that you can do for preserving linguistic Yeah, this and is. What, what, what has started to happen is that the native speakers who at the youth at the youth um, three joint meeting asked asked them to ask to um, one brought in the box um, the example of Cloud Canary, which is a multi multimodal source book on mapping with the articulation and take the and the audio recording, and that's been done with four other. Four, four Russian native speakers. Um, and there, be, there were several people who I've worked with who are now becoming interested in the language enough to want to present themselves, to want to produce their own papers. So not just 
potential for speech to come from anywhere in the different branches that could be taken, that the world could publish in their own right. Um, so it's increasing their own value, and it's increasing, I think, the social value of the <coughs> The social capital. So, you think this is enough to value uh, the. I think if we value, if we, if we manage the, to show uh, the value of something, it's far more likely to be kept. If I didn't know that this gold was valuable, I might just throw it away. It's got monetary value. But there are other Oh, one last small question, yes. Uh, it's also uh, information to the session. So do, do you see... The, uh, is, there's a mic, just, oh. yeah, just, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. So uh, do, do you see in the nearby future that there will be departments for yes. modern yes. South Arabian yes. languages yes. In, yes. in Oman? There is a missionary college in Al-Baida. Ah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm not sure what that will happen. Um, part of the problem that we've got is that the, the medal is just a brown ball in the old library, which was probably um, which was enrichified for, for a very long way. Um, and so it's it's a bit it's a bit tricky. Okay, I think yeah, we should wrap it up and thank uh, Janet, for a wonderful talk about language documentation, which is yeah, a very important uh, fact. Before leaving, please, uh, we would like to hand out the, uh, at least for those uh, who have been um, registered for dinner, to hand out the badges. So it would be much easier for us. So, um, so these badges are necessary for dinner at uh, 7.30 um, dans la cuisine, or restaurant dans la cuisine, which is 10 minutes walk from here. So uh, all those who are registered, please, please come uh, yeah, to, perhaps we could do that over here. And then uh, those who aren't registered and would like to have dinner with us, if they're not that numerous, we could always uh, yeah, they can join us and then pay directly at the restaurant uh, themselves. It's that's possibilities also there. Okay, thank you very much for being here. And uh, yeah, let's um, yeah after th so handing over the bed, there will be some time. And those who don't know where the restaurant is, we uh, can uh, yeah meet up at seven fifteen here in the foyer, and then we all go together to the restaurant. So thank you again.